Hello and welcome to the Global Debate, the show where we discuss issues that matter to the world. I'm Tina Jha. On the show today, we are going to talk about maritime security. today faces a range of maritime security challenges. Overall, maritime traffic fell due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but piracy and armed robberies of ships rose nearly 20% in just the first half of 2020. Piracy incidents nearly doubled in Asia, West Africa, the Straits of Malacca and Singapore, and the South China Sea is also one of the most affected areas. This year, a drone attack on an Israeli vessel in the Gulf of Oman killed two crew members. Insecurity has risen to unprecedented levels in the Gulf of Guinea, Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea. These concerns were cited by UN Secretary General's Chef de Cabinet, Maria Luisa Ribeiro Viotti, at a debate on ensuring security for seafarers. In order to overcome the threat to open seas, the UN representative called for an integrated global response. Mr. President, throughout our work, we need to ensure that our response recognizes the clear link between security and sustainability. For without security, the sustainable and responsible development of the oceans and its resources is impossible. The open debate was organized by India, which held the rotating presidency of the UN Security Council in August. It was the first time that maritime security was discussed in a holistic manner as an exclusive agenda item at the high-level open debate. It was also the first time that an Indian Prime Minister presided over a debate at the UN Security Council. Prime Minister Modi presented a global roadmap based on five principles to help advance global action. The first, remove barriers from legitimate maritime trade. Second, resolve maritime disputes peacefully in line with international law. This, the Prime Minister said, was extremely important to promote trust and confidence and ensure global peace and stability. Third, Modi proposed that countries jointly tackle maritime threats from non-state actors and natural disasters. Fourthly, he suggested conservation of the maritime environment and marine resources in the wake of rising marine pollution from plastic waste and oil spills. The Prime Minister's fifth principle called for responsible maritime connectivity with global norms and standards to boost maritime trade. Samandar Hamari Saja Darora hai. Hamare Samudri Raste International Trade ki lifeline hai. Or subsebari baat yahi hai ki samandar Hamare planet ke babish ke liye bhot matupun hai. लेकिन हमारी इस साझा समुद्री दरोहर को आज कई प्रकार की चुनौतियों का सामना करना पड़ रहा है पायरेसी और आतंकवाद के लिए समुद्री रास्तों का दुरुपयोग हो रहा है अनेक देशों के बीच मैरिटाइम डिस्प्यूट्स हैं और क्लाइमेट चेंज तथा प्राकृतिक आपदाएं भी मैरिटाइम डोमेन से जुड़े विषय हैं इस व्यापक संदर्भ में अपनी साझा सामुद्रिक धरोहर के संरक्षण और उपयोग के लिए हमें आपसी समझ और सहयोग का एक फ्रेमवर्क बनाना चाहिए ऐसा फ्रेमवर्क कोई भी देश अकेले नहीं बना सकता Russian President Vladimir Putin suggested a maritime security body in the UNSC to address maritime crimes, piracy and maritime terrorism. 
we should think about establishing a special structure within the UN system that would directly deal with the issue of fighting maritime crime in various regions. This structure should be based on the support of the UN member states and actively engage experts, representatives of the civil society, academia, and private sector. While US Secretary of State Blinken said the freedom of navigation over flight and unimpeded flow of maritime commerce is critical to security of nations. He also highlighted critical areas where maritime rules are under threat, like the South China Sea. Some may assert that resolving the dispute in the South China Sea is not the business of the United States or any other country that is not a claimant to the islands and waters. But it is the business and even more the responsibility of every member state to defend the rules that we've all agreed to follow and peacefully resolve maritime disputes. On this edition of the Global Debate, we will discuss the various aspects of maritime security, its significance in international relations and global security, the growing challenges at both regional and global levels, and the need for a collaborated approach by the world players to tackle these concerns. Joining us is a brilliant panel of experts on the subject, so let me introduce them to you. I'm joined on the program by Dr. Christian Buger, Professor of International Relations on Maritime Security, University of Copenhagen, Denmark. Commander Abhijit Singh retired. He's a senior fellow and head of Maritime Policy Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. And Mr. John Bradford, senior fellow, Maritime Security Program, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Singapore. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on the global debate on Sunset TV. Dr. Bugar, let me come to you for the first word. Maritime security today is an important aspect of global security. In fact, in some countries, it is the core area of concern. Yet, this very important subject was discussed in a holistic manner as an exclusive agenda item for the first time at the United Nations Security Council. So in the current times, how significant was the debate on maritime security at the Security Council? And do you see any outcome of this very, very important debate? Yes, uh, I absolutely agree that the UN Security Council debate was vital for maritime security. And I also think it is a good yardstick for how significant it is for the international community. And first of all, we could see that there are actually three different dimensions to maritime security that matter. The first one is the interstate dimension and the question of maritime governance. The second one is the question of uh, extremist violence at sea or maritime terrorism. And the third one, different expressions of crime at sea. And here we can talk about piracy, illegal fishing, uh, but also the environmental dimension. And it was fascinating to see how all these three featured prominently in the debate there was perhaps less agreement on the interstate dimension. And that quite obviously has to do with the South China Sea and the problem of gray zone tactics being used at sea by Russia and China, among others. But there was quite a substantial consensus uh, in the council that more can be done to tackle maritime terrorism and blue crime together. And there was quite a heavy emphasis also on the importance of the environmental dimension, climate change, pollution, for instance, from oil spills, uh, but also illegal fishing. And I think the proposal made uh, by India, as well as Russia in the debate, to work towards new cooperative structures to tackle these challenges together was the main outcome, actually, of the debate. And I really look forward to see how these proposals will be taken forward by the permanent members of the UN Security Council, but also by the other members in order to ensure that we do have the right cooperative structures through which we can tackle uh, these maritime security challenges. And I think we are on the right way. Uh, Commander Singh, let me come to you and understand what we have witnessed in India as well is 
maritime security is very vital to India's interests because, of course, of our strategic location. But in this sense, in recent years, what we have wit witnessed, uh, maritime security becoming central to our foreign policy. So first, there were initiatives by the government to enhance cooperation within the region. And now this sort of direction, a global roadmap on enhancing maritime security. How do you see India's emergence in the global maritime domain? Well, I'd like to begin by saying that, you know, maritime security is a buzzword today, uh, essentially because unlike land, where, you know, there is there, there are no um, global commons, uh, the seas are a, are a region that uh, most countries do treat as, as a sort of heritage of mankind, right? It, 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 it is, truly speaking, a global common. And what happens at sea really has a bearing not just on national security, uh, and national well-being, but also, I mean, as you said, foreign policy. It, it, it is a foreign policy issue. And so it's important to show that we have a stake or every country has a stake in what is called maritime governance. And I think uh, the recent debate in the uh, UN Security Council did show that a lot of these countries do care about holistic responses to the challenges that we are facing. Now, there's been this debate for a long time in India uh, whether the traditional security challenges we face with regard to China, Chinese deployments in the Indian Ocean, um, and for that matter, the wider Indo-Pacific region, are they as important as, uh, as the challenges we are facing in the non-traditional security domain, uh, domain those of piracy, of, of armed robbery, you know, terrorism, uh, climate change, and a lot of other things that uh, uh, Dr. Bugo spoke about. Uh, and and uh, we know no close to resolving that dispute because there's there's really two sides of the coin that, that that each of those areas are strong areas. But from a foreign policy perspective, it is important to have an inclusive strategy, which is why Prime Minister Modi a couple of years back when he went to the Shanghai Dialogue, he spoke of a strategy that can get all of the members into the tent, as it were, an inclusive strategy. And so therefore, what we are looking at and 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 what we're really sort of talking about here is not the issues of the here and now. This is not just about national security, about Chinese deployments, et cetera. This is also about you know, finding common cause or making common cause with, with your partners, you know, uh, looking at ways in which you can deal, you can engage with institutions, uh, the way you can build capacities collectively. How can you rally your partners to support a free and open uh, notion of the seas? And I think in that respect, we've made some progress because a large number of countries, and barring a few like China and some others, actually do understand that we are basically on this, we, we are in the same boat and we face the same challenges. And we've got to look for ways in which we can tackle those challenges collectively. Absolutely. And the focus has been to, you know, use UC as a medium of opportunities and at the same time look at the challenges and approach them in a collective manner. Mr. Bradford, coming to you to understand a relatively new term as well, uh, Commander Singh said maritime security is a buzzword. So is Indo-Pacific. And whenever we talk about maritime security, Indo-Pacific is a very, very important region, so to say, because it is also believed to be one of the drivers of global economy. But when we talk about challenges as well, because with opportunities, there are also challenges in the region. If you could take us through some of the key challenges in the Indo-Pacific region and how how, does the world think that they, they can be addressed? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely. The Indo-Pacific is a maritime domain. Um, it is a place that is uh, bookmarked and book, bookshelved by great maritime powers, uh, and there's a great deal of transit. But there's challenges to these sea lanes. And I could kind of put them into three categories. First is environmental challenges, uh, which includes not only environmental degradation, which is done by humans, uh, but also things like natural disasters uh, that hit uh, maritime communities the hardest. The second, I would call non-state threats. These are humans that take advantage of a lack of governance to push their own agendas, uh, and they would include uh, IU fishermen, in, in, uh, illegal fishermen. They would include pirates uh, and also terrorists. Uh, and then finally would be state-based threats. Um, and in this area, you know, states are competing at sea uh, but when traditional deterrence is high, then they move into these so-called gray zone tactics, where once again, they take advantage of weak governance to try to get an edge over each other. Um, and I think that these challenges are really coming to the forefront 
uh, global of global thinking because they're they're getting more severe, and, and they're getting more severe because. A, we're more reliant than ever on the sea. So any challenges that take place at sea, any threats are a greater threat to states. They're a greater states threat to communities. They're a greater threat to our economic well-being. Um, but also, not only are we more dependent on the sea, but all of the challenges are actually getting worse. With the challenges of climate change uh, and the environmental destruction, which has taken place over the last decades, um, this is now causing environmental damage, which is greater than ever. Um, pirates and terrorists and other uh, criminals are as emboldened as ever. They have more opportunity than ever. Um, and then, as already has been alluded to, uh, in an era of great power competition and a sort of return of uh, geopolitical power plays, um, the state-based contest is becoming both more dire and more dangerous. Um, so I think that is why, when it's multi-layered like this and the threats are very varied, that's why you need the sort of holistic, comprehensive responses uh, that my two panelists have already talked about. Uh, Dr. Pyoga, coming back to you and looking at the biggest challenge which has emerged ever since the COVID pandemic hit the world. In fact, one of the uh, high senior officials of the United Nations was quoted as saying that incidents of armed robbery and sea piracy have gone up by 20% in just the first half of 2020. What is the best way forward to deal with such kind of crimes in the sea? Piracy continues to be one of the main problems uh, on the maritime security agenda. And indeed, uh, it is also the area where much progress actually has been achieved over the last years. In that sense, the statistics are a little bit uh, misleading. I think a lot of efforts have been made, uh, in particular in the Gulf of Guinea and, and in West Africa recently, which also show promises. We should not forget that in the Western Indian Ocean and in Somalia, uh, piracy is fully, fully contained. And uh, if we're looking at Southeast Asia, we should not forget that uh, piracy and piracy is not the same thing because sometimes we are, uh, we are rather looking at relatively small incident that have a little, little impact actually. But this is not to say that uh, we shouldn't be uh, concerned about piracy. And one of the things that uh, the newly proposed UN structure could do is to ensure that lessons are basically transferred across regions. That uh, what happens in, Gulf, in the Gulf of Guinea can inform what happens in Southeast Asia and, and so on. So we need better exchange of lessons, continued efforts at information sharing, and then also carefully think about how we can learn from the piracy success to tackle with all the other blue crimes, in particular, uh, if it comes to uh, the environment, because these are the crimes and the issues of the future that we need to start taking seriously now and not in 10 years. Certainly. Commander Singh, also not just piracy. This, this is something that, of course, the world needs to take seriously. But also, uh, maritime security is being undermined by challenges around uncontested boundaries and navigation routes. And despite legal instruments which, you know, which are there to uphold maritime security, incidents are only increasing in different parts of the world. Yeah, uh, you made a good point. So, so, so actually, I feel that both piracy and the rules-based order are rather contentious issues. Uh, and I think piracy is uh, contentious, contentious for the reason that the piracy that we're seeing happen in Southeast Asia, as also the Gulf of Ghani, is qualitatively different from what we saw in Somalia. Somalia was really piracy because it was not happening in, uh, in, in territorial waters or easiest. This was in international waters. Somalia at that point didn't have uh, any, any territorial waters or, or, or for really easiest. But you see, what's happening in uh, Southeast Asia and Gulf of Ghana is really armed robbery. And when armed robbery happens, uh, there can be very little international cooperation to tackle armed robbery happening in some countries' territorial waters or even the EECs. Most countries are reluctant to let other maritime forces enter those waters. So there is a little bit of a gray area when it comes to governance there. And uh, it's it's very hard to administer international responses when they when they happen in areas that are very close to a country's coastline. So I think that's the reason why 
there are uh, debates over what's the best way forward with regard to piracy. With regard to uh, the uh, rules-based order, you know, this is another buzzword. Everyone uses it. But the fact is that there's no clarity on what those rules should be. Uh, for instance, if you were to speak to China and also perhaps Russia, they would say that this entire discussion around rules-based order is simply a way of uh, calling out the China challenge. It's simply a way of implicating China in what we're seeing happening uh, in the South China Sea. And it's, uh, it's basically a Western conspiracy. And India is actually seen to be a part of that Western bloc. But from the other side, this looks like it is the Chinese that are really in violation of, of this rules-based order because they are the ones that are resorting to open aggression. If you look at uh, what's happening in the literals of the South China Sea, the manner in which they have reclaimed islands, they have used their militias that John spoke about, you know, gray zone operations, the, the, just the way in the way the PLA Navy operates in those waters, it's very clear that they, co they consider that whole space as a Chinese backwater, a Chinese lake. And if you were to look at the new laws that they have issued on, on, on their Coast Guard, you know, given their, their Coast Guard powers to just stop any ship and, and, and you know, and, and interrogate the crew, etc., it goes to show that the Chinese are really in violation of the rules. But uh, there is no understanding on what the rules are. And therefore, the rules-based order, as it were, is slightly contentious. But I would say that uh, ultimately, this is a matter of consensus. It's a matter of getting uh, the, the big powers in the region to agree on what they should do to enforce those rules. The problem in the UN uh, system is that you can have all the rules you want in the world, but there's very little that you can do to enforce those rules, unless you have agreement among, among, among big countries. Certainly. And there, I think, if we can succeed, then I think we can, we can make some progress ahead. Mr. Bradford, the question is, there is so much ambiguity on the term rules-based order. And of course, there are countries who are asserting their claims overseas and n not following the international rules. Yeah, so first, here's a point where I may disagree a bit with my, uh, my good friend, Arjit. The I believe there is uh, a set of rules out there. Um, and I do believe that most countries agree to them. Uh, and I do believe that most countries have signed up to them. Um, and the idea is that there are international treaties, the four mostly among them, the, the UN Charter and the Law of the Sea, but others as well. Uh, and the bulk of the international community has agreed to these, and the bulk of the international community follows them. Uh, and they are in no way a conspiracy. Uh, in almost all cases, especially in the case of UNCLOS, they were a matter of compromise between big powers and northern powers and southern powers, the terms of the day at the time. Um, Non-aligned states played a very important role in crafting those uh, those compromises and leading the way to where we have today. And so in, when states are in violation of them, uh, it's not a controversial thing. When a state is in violation of them and gets taken to an international court and says, oh, the court doesn't apply to me, uh, that's not a matter of there not being rules. That's a matter of states choosing not to follow them. So now the other half of your question, though, is, you know, what do we do about it? Um, in my mind, the very first thing that we as an international community need to do is to ensure that all of the states that are following the rules have the ability to govern their maritime space. Um, and how do we do that? I mean, you know, it, they are the ones who are responsible under the system for governing the space. They're the ones for enforcing the domestic laws and, for, and indeed international law. Um, and so they need to have information, as Christian talked about. They need to have uh, information sharing uh, that they can receive intelligence from other nations. And then the countries which are less wealthy and have less resources, um, you know, should work together with the more powerful and the more wealthy countries to do capacity transfer, whether that be equipment or, or training, et cetera. Okay. And then those states have that capacity to prevent attacks by pirates, to prevent smuggling, to prevent other things. But they also have the ability to stand up against gray zone tactics, and they have an ability to stand up against states that don't want to respect the rule of law. Um, and then the second thing that we need to do is we need to convince all the states that these are the rules of law, and you need to follow them. Um, and as you say, uh, it's difficult to do that by being short of war. Um, but we should do our best. Uh, we should call them out at the UN. We should call them out uh, in public. We should have discussions about them. We should clarify the rules. Um, and we should just not, you know, we, we can't just sit back and let that behavior continue. 
Okay. So, Dr. Bugger, we are in a situation where there are laws, countries have, uh, you know, ratified the law, but the contradiction is that those countries who have ratified the law are themselves not adhering to it. Is this where we need a new institutional structure because the existing ones aren't as effective as they should be? I think it's important also to be a little bit more optimistic here. And this optimism starts out from, uh, we need to focus on what, what the problems actually are that require attention. And quite obviously, no one wants to revamp the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And sometimes uh, the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea or all the other uh, legal regulations, they are a little bit uh, ambiguous, uh, quite obviously. But we can still use them to address the problems that actually matter to people. Too much of our attention goes to uh, interstate rivalries and things like that, uh, ignoring that it is uh, issues such as piracy, this uh, everyday crime, it's environmental pollution that matters to people and undermines their well-being. And I do hope that India follows up on the UN Security Council initiative and takes leadership in leading that discussion on how we can work together to solve these problems that matter to people. Absolutely. Uh, Commander Singh, coming to you for the last word. So maritime security is very, very diverse, but you know, what's surprising is that there is no international consensus on the definition of the word. It is a central aspect of global affairs, of foreign policy today, but a definition does not exist. The significance that it deserves is perhaps missing. So what is the way forward to enhance maritime security and make it a central aspect of global affairs? Well, I think the way forward is to be cognizant of the fact first that we are in an era of fiscal stringency post-COVID. Uh, no one really has the resources to fight all the challenges at sea, which is why we, we need a holistic uh, understanding of maritime security. And we need to make common cause with each other. We need to understand each other's concerns and then uh, take the discourse forward on security. So I think that uh, uh, the pandemic has in many ways presented us with an opportunity to understand and empathize with each other's concerns and, and look at ways in which we can collectively solve this. But let's be very clear that on maritime governance and marine governance, there are questions uh, that remain unresolved. And I, I spoke about one of the uh, contentious issues, which is the rules-based order. And I would agree completely with John that there's by and large an understanding on what those rules should be. But really, it is the specifics, you know, it is the, it's the nuance there that uh, some countries are pointing to. For instance, what about access to the EEZs? China doesn't have a problem with the rules. It's, it's, its problem with a specific rule is the interpretation of the UNCLOS in which a couple of countries uh, interpret the rule in a way that, uh, it, that, that the rule allows them to enter China's EEZs and transit through it. Now, that's the correct interpretation, even in my view as an expert, but the Chinese don't agree with that. Uh, uh, what I think is that countries have to understand that in many areas, domestic legislation is not in keeping with international convention. Yes. So I think it's for all countries to look at their domestic legislation. Uh, Japan, you know, the other countries, Indonesia, they all have had a problem with, uh, with the fishing regulation. So I think we've got to first correct the domestic legislation, bring it in line with the with, uh, with, uh, international convention, and then look at ways in which we can find consensus on the contentious rules. And I think uh, we, we, we can make headway if there is political willingness to do so. Okay, so that's all the time we have for on this edition of the Global Debate. Thank you once again to all my guests, uh, Dr. Buger, Mr. Bradford, and Commander Singh for joining us on the program and sharing your perspective with us and our viewers on this very, very important subject. So that's it from us on this edition of the Global Debate. See you again next time. Thanks very much for your time.